I offer you these words from the 31st chapter of the prophet Jeremiah for our fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. I invite you to open your hearts to these words. Behold, the days are coming, says God, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their spouse, says God. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer will they need to teach one another or remind one another to listen to God, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, and they will listen to me, for I will forgive their misdeeds and remember their sin no more. Let us pray. Holy One, Open our minds and our hearts to new perspectives and possibilities as we consider our covenant with you and with one another. Amen. Exactly one year ago on this date and at this time, St. Patrick's Day, I was sitting in a surgery waiting room at the University of Minnesota Hospital while my beloved Mark was enduring what would be a 10-hour procedure to repair and restore his beautiful, albeit complicated and severely damaged heart. This was the kind of experience for which one gets their affairs in order and make sure end-of-life decisions are spoken and documents outlining hopes are signed and sealed and secured with those in authority to follow their directives. The weeks prior to the surgery were filled with conversations one never wants to have but must. Relationship-defining moments secured by faith and trust in the other to say out loud, thoughts not yet articulated. Information was shared with family and friends as we knew immediately this was a path we did not want to walk alone. And plans were made for recovery, always the focus on recovery, even though we had no idea what that journey would bring and that there would likely be surprises along the way, which there were. It was a teary goodbye following a necessary time of prayer during which Duane and one of Mark's surgeons and a nurse and I laid hands on Mark. And then I made my way to join other families separated from their loved one as we all wondered together how the day would unfold. I did not wait alone. My sister was soon there, one who has been by my side through many of life's arduous moments. And a family friend of Mark's who worked at the hospital kept checking in with reassurance and care. This is an experience known to many of you, watching the minutes slowly tick by on the clock on the wall wondering if the next moment might bring news so greatly desired. I have been with some of you through a time of waiting, and it is a holy privilege to bear witness to one holding vigil. As time moved unbearably slowly and while consumed by worry, I also considered the meaning of community. It's something we speak of here in this place every week, 
what it means to be community at a time such as this, what it looks like to live together within God's care and keeping, what is significant as we work together to live out our faith and make the world a more hospitable place. I will admit to you that as a pastor, I have not always known where I fit within the spiritual community that I lead. And there have been numerous times in the last 30 years where I have felt apart from rather than a part of the gathered faithful of the church where I minister, which I have always understood to be necessary so as not to become the focus of ministry, but rather to guide and empower others to do the work to which ministry beckons. I've always believed in the power of prayer, and so I shared with you all what was to come in the weeks before this day one year ago. Because although I could not articulate it then, and neither could Mark, community is what we were desperate for. And in those long hours one year ago, I felt held embraced in prayer by so many of you. It was a physical feeling, much like how I felt when Melanie sang, there is a balm in Gilead. Remembering it now brings it back so vividly, so clearly I have goosebumps on my skin. It was a physical feeling, this holding this embrace, and it was a surprise to me, unexpected. And even though in those moments I had no idea what the future would hold and that surviving the surgery was only the first step in a long recovery process for Mark, I could feel myself surrender into this holy encountering of being lifted and loved and supported. And it sustained me. Not only on that day, but in the many days, weeks, and months to come. The scripture text I just read is part of a collection of hopeful words addressed to exiled Judeans in Babylon. The section of the prophet's book, chapters 30 through 33, is sometimes called the little book of consolation. Isn't that lovely? I hope it makes you want to read it. Jeremiah 30 through 33, the little book of consolation. Jeremiah is not known as a prophet of good news, and typically his messages are dire and condemning. This may be why the words here seem to carry so much joy. So I'll remind you of God's promise. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. God speaks directly to a suffering people living with the recent trauma of exile and homelessness, promising to save and restore and heal. But let us be clear, there is nothing new about what God is doing here. This is not the first time a covenant with God's people has been ordained, but time and time again the people break their part of the deal living outside of God's law, mistreating others and their own selves, relying on their own misguided judgment rather than leaning in to the love and leading of God. And just when we think that God might rain down punishment on God's people as a consequence, we read how God's heart twists with pain for God's stubborn population and then continues to make a new covenant with the same old people. And now, those people are us. Here is what I have come to deeply believe. How faithful we are in covenant depends on how we tend one another in community. 
Our theme for Lent has been embracing an ethic of care, and those words invite us to be thoughtful about how we treat one another, how we lift one another up, how we show up and stand up for those who join us in the pews every week, those who we sip coffee with on Sunday mornings, and even those we do not see as they are part of our ever-broadening virtual community. We spend a lot of time at Plymouth talking about how we are called to heal a hurting world and the people who reside within it, taking our faithful intentions out there. But that mission, it must begin right here. Right here, cultivating respect, reaching out with love, seeking relationship with those we know only by face because we still haven't learned their name. A covenanted community takes great care with prayers that are offered, pays attention to those who know pain, is willing to sit in silence with one who needs the comfort of another, and maybe even sing to them. We become the living reminders to one another that God is good, that God's love is invoked through our own words and actions, that God is for us and not against us no matter how heavy the load we carry. God's promise in our scripture text assures us that God will keep showing up for us. So therefore, we must keep showing up for each other. Poet, essayist, novelist Wendell Berry writes in his first book of essays, originally published in 1969, a community is the mental and spiritual condition of knowing that the place is shared and that the people who share the place define and limit the possibilities of each other's lives. It is the knowledge that people have of each other, their concern for each other, their trust in each other, the freedom with which they come and go among themselves. I appreciate this vision of community as it conflates shared responsibilities, hopes, and aspirations with care and concern. Community does not cease to exist because we are removed from it. The tender knowing of being held I so palpably felt in that hospital waiting room happened when I was not present with you, but away from you. It is that covenant, that bond that we hold within the bounds of God's love that extends even when we aren't physically in the space where community exists. And how do we build this kind of sustaining, caring community? Here again, I agree with Barry, who writes, how can they know each other if they have never learned each other's stories? If they do not know each other's stories, how can they know whether or not to trust each other? People who do not trust each other do not help each other, and moreover, they fear each other. And so I will say again what I have said hundreds of times to you before, and maybe you can all say it with me, it's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. The covenant we have with God and one with another conditions our commitment to one another. We live out our covenant with God when we take precious time to know and be known, to care and be cared for, to love and be loved, all within this sacred community. With the significance of covenant and community so prominently on my mind this week, I was deeply moved by one of our Lenten reflections, which I received by email. I hope some of you are too. It included the prose poem, Gate A4, by Naomi Shihab Nye. And here is an excerpt. Wandering around the Albuquerque Airport terminal after learning my flight had been delayed four hours, I heard an announcement. 
If anyone in the vicinity of gate A4 understands any Arabic, please come to the gate immediately. Well, one pauses these days. Gate A4 was my own gate. I went there. An older woman in full traditional Palestinian embroidered dress, just like my grandma wore, was crumpled to the floor, wailing. I stooped to put my arm around the woman and spoke haltingly. The minute she heard any words she knew, however poorly used, she stopped crying. She thought the flight had been canceled entirely and she needed to be in El Paso for major medical treatment the next day. I said, no, no, we're fine. You'll get there just later. We called her son. I spoke with him in English. I told him I would stay with his mother till we got on the plane and ride next to her. She talked to him. Then we called her other sons, just for the fun of it. <laughs> then we called my dad, and he and she spoke for a while in Arabic and found out, of course, that they had ten shared friends. <laughs> then I thought, just for the heck of it, why not call some Palestinian poets I know and let them chat with her? This all took up two hours. She was laughing a lot by then telling of her life, patting my knee, answering questions. She had pulled a sack of homemade mamul cookies, little powdered sugar crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts from her bag and was offering them to all the women at the gate. And to my amazement, not a single woman declined one. It was like a sacrament. The traveler from Argentina, the mom from California, the lovely woman from Laredo, we were all covered with the same powdered sugar, and we were smiling. There is no better cookie. And I looked around that gate of late and weary ones, and I thought, this is the world I want to live in, the shared world. Not a single person in that gate, once the crying of confusion had stopped, seemed apprehensive about any other person. They took the cookies. I wanted to hug all those other women, too. This can still happen anywhere. Not everything is lost. And I will add, this is the church I long for, the church that I vision, the church that I know is possible right here. Mark and I will be married in August. Yeah, come on. I was looking for a little bit of that. That feels good. And we will be doing so here at Plymouth within our community of care. Because our covenant invites us not only to stand alongside one another in sorrow and heartbreak, but to rejoice in the goodness and gifts of relationship and love. We're eager to have you share in our joy, so don't worry, you'll all be invited. Today is a significant day for Mark and for me. Yes, the surgery was a success. Yes, the recovery was very difficult. Yes, there was a 99% chance things could have not ended so well. And that is a statistic I did not learn until the surgery was complete, thank goodness. But most of all, this is a significant day because of its reminder of the power of church, the goodness of God, and the transformation that can happen when we surrender to the care and keeping of one another. May it always be so. Amen.